Hello, and welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from Drexel University's Picture Gallery. Today, our guest is the award-winning writer, Andrea Barrett. Ms. Barrett, the author of eight books, has won a National Book Award and been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. In 2001, she received a MacArthur Genius Grant for her short story collection, Servants of the Map. She's just out with a new novel, The Air We Breathe. All her books combine an interest in science with stories about family and relationships. The Chicago Tribune has written of her work, and I quote, that to call Andrea Barrett our poet laureate of science is perfectly apropos as long as we recognize that her specialty is the heart. Andrea Barrett, welcome to the Drexel interview. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, you were originally um, oriented toward a career in science. You took your undergraduate degree in biology. You went on for a PhD in zoology. Mm -hmm. And then you turned to writing, or in the course of that. Could you tell us a little bit about that career trajectory? Yeah, I wish it had been as smooth as a trajectory, <laughs> but um, I, I really thought I was going to be a scientist. Um, that's almost all I did in college. I didn't take, unfortunately, any English courses in college. Um, I started a PhD program in zoology, and I didn't even make it through my first semester. I was just amazingly bad at it. Um, but you'd been good at, in science before that. I had been, and I think that's um, that was a great misunderstanding on my part. The parts of science I'm good at are reading about science <laughs> and reading about scientists. And um, it turns out to be a working scientist, you need a whole other set of skills that I was really unaware of. You need to be able to make hypotheses. You need to be able to look at the world and be able to ask questions about it that are answerable. Um, I look at the world and ask questions about it that aren't answerable. <laughs> And that's not science, that's it's metaphysics or it's um, huh. fiction. It's, it actually has to do with writing, but it took me a very long time to understand that. So um, what was the turning point for you when you realized, well, was it a movement out of science into writing, or were there No, it was really theory? just a fleeing from science, uh -huh. uh, you know, a sure sense that, oh, I really can't do this. And then um, quite a few years of wandering about around thinking, well, what can I do? Um, by best count, I had 13 jobs in the next 10 years, none of them related to any of the others, mostly various kinds of minimum wage work. I really mm -hmm. did not know what I was supposed to do or what I was good at. Um, were you really searching or were you sort of uh, just doing what you needed to do to make no, a I living? I was really searching. Uh -huh. I was you know, keeping a roof over my head but, but aware all the time that there must be something I'm good at and something I love. And, I, and what I love to do was read. And um, somehow it didn't really occur to me till quite late that, that writing was connected to that, or that a person right. could be a writer. Um, I eventually ended up back in graduate school a second time studying medieval and Reformation history, which really has nothing to do with <laughs> science. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was during that period, uh, as I was starting to write my first long papers and think about a thesis, the papers I was writing, people kept um, appearing as characters and breaking into lines of dialogue. And I kept going to my professors and saying, well, couldn't I write this paper about the Inquisition? I had this idea there would be like a person, an inquisitor on one side and a person <laughs> being examined on the other. And I could have, I could show what the Inquisition was like by having them talk to each so other. So you were imagining scenes. Yeah, and, uh -huh. and that was when the penny dropped, at least partially. Um, everything I was interested in about history, it, it was scenic, it was character-based, it had to do with people caught in their lives mm -hmm. in time in a certain situation. And actually, that's what really interested me about science. It turned out it, um, I'm very interested in the ideas of science, and I'm very interested in what it is like to be a person interested in the ideas. And neither of those things is the same as doing mm. science. I was just slow to understand that. Were your first books books in which you integrated science as much as you did in your later ones? I know your first novel was Lucid Stars. Could you tell us a little bit about the writing of that book and yeah. whether, in fact, there was a scientific component? 
Um, there's a small amount of science, but not really very much considering what I came to later. Um, it's also the case, Lucid Stars is my first published novel, but it's actually my third novel. Mm. I worked um, for quite a number of years on a first novel, went through many drafts of it, ended up having to throw it out, um, worked yeah. for another year or two on a second one, ended up having to throw that out, and finally came to Lucid Stars, which looks like my first novel, but isn't really. Um, that has to do metaphorically with both astronomy and astrology. It touches on elements of the zodiac, it touches on um, people looking for patterns in the sky, but it's not really scientific. It, it really uses astronomy um, and the search for order in the sky above us as a metaphor for this search for order within our own family life. Uh, it's mm. more an idea of the constellations of stars and the constellation of our human relationships, our family relationships that are talking to each other there. Um, did you come up with the metaphor first and then start writing the book, or did it come to you as you began writing about the family? Uh, they, they seemed to come to me at the same mm -hmm. time. Uh, much of the material in that book I had wrestled with in some way or another in the book that I worked on for so long and throughout, but I, I could never find a form for it or the right set of characters. Um, I was up in the Adirondacks on a camping trip one day, a, a place that I've since come to write about many times, and um, two things happened. We slept out. The sky is very, very dark in the Adirondacks. There's no cities around, so the stars are very brilliant, and I had brought a star wheel up to finally learn the constellations. And on that same trip, I saw a little girl in a frilly yellow bathing suit run into the water again and again. Her brother kept calling her to come in, and she obviously loved him very much, and she would run with great passion toward him, and then she would get wet up about mid-thigh, and she would panic, and she would freeze, and she couldn't go in. She'd go back to shore. He'd call her in again. Mm. And something about that scene started the novel, and the stars came into it at the same time. Oh, what a wonderful way of yeah, thinking about the germination of that. Yeah, I was very lucky yeah. that that happened all at once. So. Now, um, your 1996 collection, Ship Fever, won the National Book Award. Um, and I think you said that that was a turning point for you. Is that true? Could you explain? Uh, sure. It was, it was more than a turning point. It, you know, for me, really, was life-changing. I had um, published four novels by then, been so grateful to have them published at all, and was so out of the writing world in general that I didn't even know what um, what other writers were going through or what I was missing in some way. I, I knew that the books didn't sell and that I wasn't <laughs> getting reviews, but I, I'm not sure I even knew what it would have been like to mm -hmm. be reviewed. And I was just happy to be publishing them, but um, after four of them, all of which I think sold less than 2,000 copies apiece, um, my editor finally had to let me go, and so I, I had no publisher briefly and no editor. Um, and was sort of discouraged. I thought the fourth novel was actually pretty good. Uh, you know, the yeah. first three, I was feeling my way, but by the time I got to the fourth one, it seemed to me not such a bad novel. And Which was your fourth, by the way? It's actually called The Forms of Water, mm -hmm. and that's the one that sank completely. <laughs> the m because, you know, if you yeah. do a first novel and nobody pays attention, it's a first novel. Yeah. But by the time you've done four novels and no one's paying attention, um, people are fairly discouraged in the publishing world. In the world. publishing industry, yeah. yeah. They don't give you too many chances. No, and you know, four was more than most people get, it, and yeah. that one did just sink completely. Uh -huh. um, so I, I became discouraged at that point, too, yeah. and, um, and it seemed to me that, well, obviously I wasn't a novelist, or this I apparently wasn't very good at this, and uh, I was teaching for the first time then and really enjoying teaching short stories, which I knew very little about. Mm -hmm. and very excited by the work some of my colleagues were doing. So I thought I would try and write some short stories. And since nobody wanted to read what I was writing and no one cared what I wrote, I thought I would write about what I really loved, which was these old dead scientists. Um, mm. So I wrote these stories, which no one expected to do anything with, and was very lucky to find a, a wonderful editor um, at Norton who picked it up. It was a hard book to sell. She had mm. to convince people at her place to, to buy it. It's an odd book. Yeah. Um, and she did a wonderful job publishing it. And, and so I did get some reviews. And we sold out the first printing, which was maybe 4,000 copies. And we were all just 
thrilled and no one expected yeah. you know that was much more than we expected so, so this is your first story collection first story and collection. I guess it was your first time of really melding the scientific with the fictional yeah. so you really had both a new form and you had and I had for content. me new material um, what a nice story I was I was incredibly lucky so um, just so being nominated for, <coughs> for the award that in itself was so far beyond it what any of us expected uh -huh. it's um, very strange it really launched you then as a well-known novelist it did I mean yeah. people began to read that book and also some of the earlier books mm -hmm. and, um, and people began to review the books and uh, yeah it really just turned everything around for me terrific yeah. now tell me you uh, have continued to write short stories as well as novels the difference between writing a story and a novel how what mindset are you in when you write a story versus embarking on that I know. <laughs> that long road of a novel which you know where you're not even sure about the end but you yeah. have to really believe and you're and never sure it. you're going to get out um, you know it's sort of like the straight hair curly hair thing <laughs> <laughs> if you have curly hair you wish you had straight hair uh -huh. if you have straight hair you wish you had curly hair uh, when I'm writing a novel especially if I'm several years into it um, there's that stage for most of us where you just feel like you never are going to finish that you've mm -hmm. been mired in it forever um, and then eventually we do finish and we pull it together and it feels good um, but usually when I'm done for a no with a novel the idea of writing short stories is so appealing simply because they can be finished mm -hmm. um, because they're short because I can experiment with different forms but when I'm working on stories for a while um, because you finish a story you have to keep starting a new story <laughs> every once in a while and, yeah. and after a while of that I start to long for the bliss of getting up every day and Being knowing into something. Yes, I'm yeah. in that world I don't have to make a whole world uh -huh. from scratch I can just go and go back to that familiar territory and build some more of it they're, they're both very pleasurable but um, so going you back do and tend forth. to alternate I do. Mm. you have uh, a story collection servants of the map in which one of the stories uh, involves a tuberculosis sanitarium in the Adirondacks and your latest book the air we breathe just out um, deals with a tuberculosis sanitarium in the Adirondacks and I assume that the germ for this book was in that story it was. and I guess my first question is whether stories do work that way so you feed into your novels and second of all tell us after telling us that I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the setting or the story and the book? Um, stories, they don't feed directly into novels for me, but it's very often been the case that in the writing of a story, um, a setting or a character in the story uh, will lead to a descendant that appears in another story mm -hmm. or a novel. Um, and that happened most strongly with these two pieces. The story is called The Cure. And that has to do with women taking care of patients in private care cottages in the 1880s, roughly in 1890s. And I became so interested in the setting, um, in the situation of the patients up there, that I also started to pay attention, though I couldn't use the material then, mm -hmm. to these big public sanatoria tucked in the woods, which came into their heyday somewhat later, um, 1910 through maybe 1935 was sort of the height of those. So even as I was finishing writing The Cure, I was thinking, I wonder if I want to write a novel about one of these big public sanatoria. And, and in fact, that's how The Air We Breathe um, came about. It takes place about 25 years later than the story, but very much in the same environment. And some of the research that I initially did for the story and couldn't use made its way into this book. Mm. Um, I don't know why tuberculosis has had such a hold on me it's a funny thing to have written at such length about twice mm -hmm. but um, in in part I think it's because once I started to work with the material every place I go now and everyone I talk to whether they've read the novel or the old story after we've talked for a couple minutes almost invariably the person will say you know I had an uncle who or an aunt who or a grandmother who mm -hmm. or um, everybody's got a story in their family tuberculosis was so common during our grandparents time uh, um, not just in big cities although although there was a great deal of it in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and Philadelphia was one of the great centers for the treatment of tuberculosis